and there's a thing that happens. And the first time it happens, I was like, whoa, what is that? It's a kidnapping saga, or is it? Abigail is in theaters, <laughs> and uh, there's one big spoiler in the trailer, and we're going to talk about it. If you haven't seen the trailer, you don't know any of the spoilers, you don't want to know any of the spoilers, maybe stop now and come back to this later. But uh, we're only going to talk about the trailer, the spoiler in the trailers. We're not going to talk about any other spoilers. So, Christy, Abigail. I think he promised you. He'll all be over soon. Joey? Yeah. I'm sorry about what's going to happen to you. You got to subscribe because we are here for you, whatever the genre. It could be an art house movie. It could be a documentary. It could be a horror movie that everyone's talking about. We're here for you for all those things. So come hang out with us. Yes, Abigail, here it is. She's a vampire. Ta -da! Ta -da! I mean, not that, sh not that shocking. If you see any of the stills from the movie, if you see any of the trailer, like it's sort of hard to avoid this, but she's a ballerina vampire. And this is the second movie this week in which a ragtag band of misfits comes together to pull off a mission, which is maybe not as simple as they initially think. Um, there's a little girl named Abigail, the titular role played by Alicia Weir, who is great. We'll get to more of that later on. And she is kidnapped after doing her ballet rehearsal to Swan Lake. The, I think the the and the opening title sequence of this is for me the high point of the entire film. Just the way it's shot, the way it's edited, like really extreme camera angles. It's very dramatic, and the use of the song really sets the mood for the whole movie. So I thought that was really well done. These guys kidnap her. This whole team kidnaps her, and they put her in this mansion, which is just cavernous and infinite in its hallways and its rooms and its floors. This thing just goes on forever. Um, and so you have Melissa Barrera, Dan Stevens, uh, Angus Cloud in his final role, I believe, and a whole crew of folks. Catherine Newton, yes. All they have to do is babysit her. Giancarlo Esposito is there at the house, says all you got to do is babysit her 24 hours. This $50 million is yours. Sounds pretty easy. But it's not because, as previously mentioned, she's a vampire. <laughs> and so this is from the guys who did Ready or Not. It's a very similar structure in that, you know, instead of Samara Weaving being in the house and having to fight her way out from all these awful rich people, um, they're kind of having to survive the woman at the center of it. Um, I laughed a lot. It is a very like quippy, funny horror comedy. It's also insanely bloody, crazy amounts of blood. And there's a thing that happens. And the first time it happens, I was like, whoa, what is that? And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And it just loses novelty. And that's kind of what happens with the whole film. Like it's funny and it's wildly violent. And they use the space in very clever ways. I thought that all of the, the kidnappers had good banter with each other. I enjoyed Catherine Newton. I always enjoy Dan Stevens as just an arrogant bad guy. He had, he's so handsome. And when he uses that to play somebody awful, it's fun. I like Kevin Durand as kind of the the lung-headed muscle of the team but it loses steam it runs out of steam and it just keeps going and going and going yeah see for me it never had steam <laughs> um <laughs> i i did not find any of the kidnappers kidnappers particularly interesting we're meant to sort of you know side with melissa brera and hope that you know she clearly has more of a moral compass than any of the other folks and we get some backstories to why she's involved with this thing and what she hopes to get out of it but I didn't really care about anybody in this movie, and I didn't care about the little girls. It was like if the whole house went up in flames, I wouldn't. It wouldn't have bothered me, you know. So I didn't have a. I didn't feel like I had a stake in the outcome, and so I was bored pretty much the entire time. I didn't find it funny. It's not particularly scary. I mean, they're selling this as a horror movie, and there are some jolty, gory moments, but not really a horror movie. And um. As you said, yeah, like the the big sort of thing they come up with to do, they do several times, and it does lose the effect. Mm -hmm. 
And I just kind of felt like, you know, yeah, you're right. It is a similar setup to Ready or Not, a movie I liked much, much more than this. And I almost kind of felt like this is the thing that happens where cool indie filmmakers get a shot at doing something bigger. And so they kind of remake the movie, but with a bigger scale and more money and getting to maybe like you know, indulge in things they didn't get to with the other ones, like more hallways and more rooms and more death traps, whatever it was. But I, I didn't care about any of it. I just, I never engaged with this movie on a character level. So it didn't really matter to me once people start running around and running for their lives and, you know, trying to escape the house. I, I just wasn't invested in any of it. Yeah, it's stylish and the actors are giving it their all, but I just didn't connect with it. Yeah, Matt Batnelli open and Tyler Gillette are the directors and the guys who wrote Ready or Not also wrote this. Oh, so they're going back to that well. Um these guys also directed Scream 5 and 6, so they Which worked with I Melissa liked. Barrera there. Yeah. I think I liked 5 more than 6. We reviewed yeah, them both. Uh we did. I, I think I like 5 was probably better, but I at least I admired the the moxie of six in terms of like, we're going to leave Woodsboro. We're going to do this somewhere mm. else. And we're going to, and, and the somewhere else is New York city, you know? So we're going to, we're going to have a scene in a subway. We're going to have like all these other things that you couldn't have done in the sort of enclosed bubble of the scream universe up to that point. And so I thought they at least made the most of that flex of like, you know, trying to take it somewhere else. But yeah, overall, I agree with you. Five is probably the better film. But this is a letdown for me because I'm I am a fan of these guys. And I just didn't have any fun. I thought Alicia Weir was great, though, sure. because she has to juggle various versions of the same character. And it's a physical performance because she has to dance like mm -hmm. the totally insane way in which she incorporates ballet into killing these people or trying at least to kill these people chasing them around the house i thought was hilarious like just the the way she's just rapturously taken over by the dance which i realize we've seen in a lot of other things like suspiria for example but like and on her sweet little face, it's like horrifying and hilarious all at once. There's like a thing she does with her arms. It's very dramatic. Her swan arms, her wings. So um, I enjoy that. But she has to be a sweet little girl and also be terrifying and also torment them once it's clear what all is happening here. So I thought she had a lot of poise. You know who else she is? She is Jessie Buckley's daughter in Wicked Little Letters. Yeah, she has to be like a, a sweet, mm. innocent, mm, and then also centuries old and monstrous. And and she does it really well. Uh, kudos. <laughs> it's great casting. Her outfit's very cute because it has to be super girly. <laughs> um, and she has these cute little like pink sparkly golden goose sneakers. Yes. So <laughs> there were nice touches here and there. I can't recall who someone reviewed this and said they didn't believe that Melissa Barrera could like stick a gun in the back of her jeans because they were so tight. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go with it. Okay. Did you That's enjoy Dan Stevens at least? Don't you always? Right. <laughs> I, I can't believe this. The vampires make sense. Did you like Dan Stevens at least? He was okay. I, I I find him a little irritating all the time. Like I think my favorite performance from him is probably still uh, "I'm Your Man," where he's like the German love robot. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, like no I, vision. I, yeah, this is. Oh, that's true. Yeah, but like we're just coming off of Godzilla. Kong, where he's also playing this sort of like, <laughs> you know, annoyingly swaggery character. And I can't ever figure out, like, are you bugging me because you're Dan Stevens or are you bugging me because you're playing this character so well? I don't know. But either way, you're yeah. bugging me. <laughs> no. He's good at his job. Okay, so what's your number then on Abigail? Like a four. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I admire the effort and I, I think these filmmakers are trying to sort of like work within their wheelhouse and kind of kick it to the next level. But I, I think the kick went in the wrong direction. I'll say 6.5. I had a good time for a while. So Abigail is out there in theaters. Let us know if you see it, if you sink your teeth into it. Like, 